as the British pop band Tears for Fears once sang. This line might serve to explain the USA and USSR's dynamic on the world stage in the 20th century. Two nations, both with ambitions of shaping the world in its image. These rivals have faced off everywhere, from the desert sands of Afghanistan to the Olympic ice in Lake Placid. In the United States, American school kids were trained to duck and cover for the potential Soviet nuclear attack, learning from Bert the Turtle. Duck and cover! But believe it or not, before the near half century of tension that was the Cold War, there was a time when these two global superpowers were actually allies. Alongside the United Kingdom, they formed a super team that a comic book editor might have scrapped as unrealistic. But as the ancient proverb goes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Especially when that enemy is Nazi Germany. The horrors of the Second World War forced Winston Churchill of the United Kingdom, Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union, and Franklin Roosevelt of the United States to form a grand alliance to defeat the Axis powers once and for all. But the story doesn't end there, not by a long shot. To really understand why the U.S. and USSR can't seem to get along, we need to learn how and why the Grand Alliance began to unravel, and how one bomb changed the course of history. At a meeting in Tehran, the newly formed Grand Alliance agrees to open a second front in Europe. This ambitious task is given an appropriately dramatic name, Operation Overlord. The operation is both a deception and an invasion. Double agents feed the Germans false information, and the Allies plant fake armies complete with decoy inflatable tanks. The inflatable tanks may or may not be available to rent for birthday parties. Then, in one of the largest amphibious military invasions in modern history, on French beaches in Normandy, it's D-Day. Despite a staggering death toll during the D-Day invasion, the Allies breach the continent, opening a second front. Operation Overlord is a success. Fighting spreads from the beaches of France, through the streets of Paris, to the forests of Belgium, and into the German fatherland itself. But while the Allied troops on the Western Front are relatively new to the party, the Soviets on the Eastern Front had been fighting the Germans for more than three years, and tens of millions had already died. Soviet losses in the war against Nazi Germany were astronomical, really difficult even to fathom in some respects. In total, it's believed that the USSR suffered somewhere around 27 million dead. Something like 7,000 people a day died just at the front By the end of the conflict, roughly one in seven citizens of the USSR had been killed in the course of the war, either in the Holocaust, at the front, or starved to death in the course of the fighting. As you can imagine, both sides were determined to end this war as quickly as possible. So while troops fight on the field, Engineers on both sides work to one-up one another's guns, planes, boats, and bombs. German scientists and manufacturers supersize their weapons, inventing high-altitude bombers, enormous railway artillery guns, the first ballistic missiles, and the first cruise missiles. But the Holy Grail is still out there. A weapon that can destroy whole cities. Before the war began, German scientists discovered nuclear fission, making an atomic bomb a theoretical possibility. Many of these scientists ended up fleeing Nazi Germany and escaping to the United States, but plenty more stayed behind to work for Hitler. In October of 1939, the economist Alexander Sachs arranged an appointment with Franklin Roosevelt, conveying the message of two major scientists, Albert Einstein and Leo Szilard, about the 
potential benefits, but also the potential dangers of a nuclear weapon if one were ever to be made. Roosevelt responds to this meeting with Sachs saying, I understand where you're coming from. You want to make sure the Nazis can't blow us up. For this reason, people often cast and describe the Manhattan Project as part of a race to get the bomb, a race against Nazi Germany. The Manhattan Project. While it might sound like the name of a Sex in the City spinoff, it's something even more controversial. The sprawling yet secretive project brings together government, military, industry, and academia, working in a variety of labs and other facilities, stretching from Montreal, Quebec, to Los Alamos, New Mexico. It costs upwards of $2 billion, the equivalent of about $23 billion today. The project also employs over 130,000 people, none of whom can use it to impress their parents, because secrecy is absolutely paramount. When Truman was a senator, he had found a big hole in the federal budget, and he was on a committee looking to get corruption and waste out of wartime uh, appropriations. He went to the Secretary of War and asked Secretary Stimson, can you explain where this money has gone? And Stimson quite bluntly told him, I'm sorry, this is a top secret project and I can't tell even a U.S. senator about. And Truman had accepted that. Meanwhile, the tide is turning in Europe. So Roosevelt senses it's time to reassemble the Grand Alliance to discuss what comes next. But getting three world leaders fighting a war to meet in the same place at the same time is apparently about as easy as, well, planning D-Day. The following is a reenactment with some artistic liberties. Scotland? It would be impossible for me to leave the country. Malta, Athens, Cyprus? The Soviet Black Sea coast? UJ wants the Black Sea. Jerusalem, first-class hotels. UJ won't travel beyond the Black Sea. Yalta, Yalta. Yalta? From Malta to Yalta, let nobody alter. Yalta is as strange as it is significant. These world leaders and their generals did not stay in five-star hotels. Instead, the meeting to decide the fate of the post-war world happens in abandoned palaces, plagued with bedbugs and lice. Attendees enjoy multi-course meals, but there are only nine functioning toilets for the hundred-plus guests. We can only imagine what the small talk in that bathroom line must have been like. Churchill said that if they'd spent 10 years doing research, they couldn't have found a worse place, and that the only redeeming factor that could salvage the Yalta Conference was whiskey. This very much fit given the miserable conditions in which the three leaders would meet and the enormous difficulty of getting there in the first place. Although they meet as allies, each leader has his own oftentimes conflicting agendas as they envision their nation's role in the world after the war. And like at any meeting of the minds, there are power dynamics that need understanding. To Roosevelt, it's clear. In order to get the attention of the most desirable girl at the dance, in this case, Stalin, he needs to break the ice with some jokes. When they first met at the Tehran conference, Roosevelt tried to distinguish himself from Churchill and make clear that Great Britain and the United States were not acting in concert by teasing Churchill in front of Stalin, making jokes about his smoking habits, making jokes about how Churchill had woken up on the wrong side of the bed. Some of the jokes seemed quite juvenile, in fact, and his aim was to get Stalin to laugh, which he succeeded in doing. And at that juncture, according to Roosevelt's own recollections, he called him Uncle Joe, something that Stalin might have thought cheeky before they'd established this rapport by teasing Churchill. Churchill is an easy target for roast jokes. His propaganda office once put his head on a bulldog to raise morale. Stalin sincerely believes that the amount of blood spent by the Soviet Union in fighting Nazi Germany means the USSR deserves special recognition and a sphere of influence around Mother Russia to prevent this type of tragedy from happening to his people again. Meanwhile, one of Roosevelt's main concerns is Japan. By 1945, there are still at least 4 million Japanese soldiers keeping the Allies busy in the Pacific. You may know how the story ends for Japan, but at the time, it was not so certain. In February 1945, the Manhattan Project was underway, but it was completely unclear if it would work at all technologically and if it would have any strategic effect if it was in fact used against Japan. As a result, for, for Roosevelt, Soviet entry into the war might be 
the critical factor in defeating the empire of Japan. And as such, he was willing to sacrifice a great deal and compromise in order to convince Stalin to join the war on his side. Speaking of compromises, let's talk about Poland. Poland is a hot topic at Yalta. Let's just say that there are as many conversations about Poland as there are working toilets at Yalta. Nine. Nine working toilets. We digress. Churchill is adamant that Poland be assured free elections and a democratic government. Roosevelt wants that as well, but knows he cannot push Stalin too far. At the time of the conference, Soviet troops are less than 70 kilometers from Berlin, having entered Germany through Poland. And in the post-war world, this may or may not have entitled them to dibs. In the end, without polling the Poles, the Grand Alliance agrees to slice up Poland, giving the bulk of Eastern Poland to the Soviet Union in exchange for a loose agreement on ensuring free elections there. Emphasis on loose. Despite the looseness of the arrangement, Roosevelt and Churchill returned to their home countries optimistic. Roosevelt had gotten a commitment from Stalin to join both the nascent United Nations and the war against Japan. And the three amigos had signed a joint statement called the Declaration on Liberated Europe, promising free and unfettered elections. Does this mean they trust Stalin to deliver? Who's to say? But back in the UK, Churchill insists that he did not make the same mistake as his predecessor, saying poor Neville Chamberlain believed he could trust Hitler. He was wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong with Stalin. Here's what Roosevelt has to say before Congress. The United States will not always have its way 100%, nor will Russia, nor Great Britain. But I am sure that under the agreement reached with Yalta, it will be more stable political in Europe and the parts of it than ever before. Almost two months to the day after the Yalta conference ended, Roosevelt is sitting for this portrait when he has a terrific headache. His words. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin from CBS World News. A press association has just announced that President Roosevelt is dead. On April 12, 1945, Roosevelt dies from a cerebral hemorrhage. The world is shocked. Churchill sends his condolences. Stalin orders all government agencies in Moscow to display flags of mourning. And a new leader is thrust upon the world stage. Out of the wings comes the unknown understudy, Harry Truman. It's a tremendous shock to go from Franklin Roosevelt, this towering figure in American politics, to this virtually unknown man from Missouri. His replacement, Harry Truman, barely knew Roosevelt at all. They had met twice during the time that Truman was Roosevelt's vice president. They had barely communicated. So he doesn't understand the main figures, the main people, the main players, the main strategic agreements. When he asked what the United States had agreed to do at Yalta, nobody could find the official minutes. He, he's really adrift. Truman could not have started the job at a more complicated time. What should he do with Germany after its surrender? How does he defeat the Japanese in the Pacific? At least he finally had the security clearance to learn what that hole in the budget was all about. Shortly after he became inaugurated as president, Stimson took him aside and told him, you remember that gap in the budget that you found a couple of years ago? Now I can tell you what, what that gap is. It was for the Manhattan Project. The greatest secret of the war comes into the open. From hidden factories over the nation, under heavy army protection, the first atomic bomb was assembled. It takes about six years, seven months, and two billion dollars to develop the first plutonium bomb after the discovery of nuclear fission. But the gadget, as it was called, needs to be tested. So on July 16, 1945, in the conveniently named Jornada del Muerto Desert Basin, which literally translates to Working Day of the Dead, the first atomic bomb test takes place. No one quite knew what was going to happen here. There was even some concern that the thing might blow up New Mexico. So they started the countdown around perhaps four in the morning. And just before dawn, a very dark moment, they counted down to zero. The energy that generates the heat of the sun and operates the solar system comes under the will of humankind. The explosion itself is 
far bigger than many of them imagine, about the equivalent of 18,000 tons of TNT. And eyewitnesses indicated that they could see signs of the explosion from even two, 300 miles away from the test site. That was the first mushroom cloud from a nuclear explosion. Meanwhile, across the world, Berlin lies in ruin and Hitler lies dead in his bunker. The Germans had surrendered. It was time to get the band back together again, this time with a new frontman. The third major summit is set in Potsdam, a suburb of Berlin now occupied by the Soviets. The mood of the Potsdam conference initially is quite optimistic. It's quite cheerful. It's even playful. They're having champagne celebrations. They're playing piano. They're celebrating. They've beaten Nazi Germany. They've won this tremendous war. They now know about the concentration camps, so they know about the depth of the evil that they've destroyed. They've won. They've done what they wanted to do. Truman might be the freshman of the Grand Alliance, but at Potsdam, he receives news that will change the world forever. During the conference, he's handed a piece of paper that in very badly coded bureaucratic English tells him that the atomic bomb test has worked. A nuclear weapon is no longer simply a theoretical possibility. It's a reality. It exists. Churchill already knows about the weapon. The question is, what do they share with Stalin? Do they tell Stalin that the atomic bomb project has worked? If so, how do they tell him and how much do they tell him? The decision they reached was not to use the word atomic and to try to approach it in as calm and casual a manner as possible. So at the end of one of the sessions, shortly after a rather contentious discussion on Poland, Truman simply walked up to Stalin, told him that the United States had produced this new weapon. I told uh, Stalin that we had the most powerful explosive that had ever been discovered in the history of the world and that we expected to use it on Japan. He uh, smiled at me and bowed and said he was glad we had the ex explosive and he hoped that it would end the Japanese war. I don't think he knew what I was talking about because he didn't display any surprise at all. Stalin reacted in a way that most people who had their eyes on Stalin, that's included Winston Churchill and William Leahy, they didn't think that Stalin understood the importance of what Truman was telling him. And of course, they couldn't have been more wrong. Of course Stalin understood the importance of what Truman was telling him. He already knew of the Manhattan Project because it had been infiltrated by Soviet spies from the start. So when Truman tells Stalin about the weapon, it's almost like that one scene from Friends where Ross tells the group something that everybody already knows and Phoebe goes, That is brand new information! <laughs> you already know, don't you? A little bit. Plans for the bomb had been smuggled out of the Los Alamos base, taken in secret to the Soviet embassy in New York, and then to Stalin. It's basically the plot from the Star Wars movie Rogue One, but with memorable characters. Probably the most notable of the Soviet spies was a German physicist named Klaus Fuchs, who was placed at the very center of the bomb program. As Oppenheimer said later, he could not have been more intimately placed and positioned as a spy than he was. There's an old saying that every conversation is really three conversations. What you said, what you meant to say, and what the other side understood. The Americans and the British thought that they had communicated what they wanted to communicate, that there was this new weapon, it would be used against Japan only, but that it was no threat to the Soviet Union. The Soviets think that they were being blackmailed with the atomic bomb into changing their position on Poland. The United States and Britain did not connect the two things, but the Soviet delegation most certainly did. What ends up happening is that the United States and Britain walk away from that very brief meeting thinking that they've done what they wanted to do. They've told Stalin about this weapon without revealing too much. Instead, what they did is increase in Stalin's mind the fear that the United States and Britain would use the atomic bomb uh, to leverage the Soviet Union in ways that would demonstrate that the Soviet Union was becoming an enemy, not one of the Grand Alliance anymore. The Greek historian Thucydides described war as a rough master. His book on the Peloponnesian War talks about how when states begin to fight wars, when they begin to fight total wars, morality goes out the window, everything goes out the window in the effort to, to win the war. Once the Germans began bombing civilians on a large scale in Poland, essentially the gloves came off and all of the major combatants began practicing strategic bombing on a large scale. 
The aim was to destroy entire cities. In the spring of 1945, Tokyo would be subject to the largest firebombing raid of the war, a raid that estimated to kill over 100,000 people and created heat so intense that the rivers of Tokyo actually boiled in the course of the bombing. All that before the atomic bomb. And still, the Japanese refused to surrender. In fact, Emperor Hirohito vows to fight to the last man. Now with this new weapon in his arsenal, Truman must weigh his options carefully. To end the war against Japan, there are a number of options. The United States and Britain could have done an invasion of the Japanese home islands, which will be by far the costliest in terms of human life. They could conduct an air campaign as they had been doing, although they're running out of targets because of the damage that has already been done to Japan. They could try a blockade, although that could take a very long time. Each of those comes with significant downsides, especially in the cost of human life. The atomic bomb seems to many American strategists to get them the end of the war as quickly as possible with the lowest loss of life, not only among American and British forces, but among Japanese civilians as well. That is, the atomic bomb will be terrible, it will be awful, but it will get the war over as quickly as possible. Truman went with option number four. The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many foes. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. Three days later, another atomic bomb is dropped this time on Nagasaki, a city of 263,000 people. Later that night, the USSR invades Manchuria. Finally, Japan surrenders. The news of final surrender, the news that peace had at last been won, penetrated to every corner of the globe. Peace, the hope of mankind, had arrived. In every corner of the battered world, men rejoiced, cheered the end of World War II. One of my earliest memories is the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. To me, the notion that something called the atomic bomb put an end to this huge world-scale event was profound, even at eight years of age. I understood that the world had changed forever. The bombs changed everything. When you destroy everything in a city, you destroy all the buildings in the city, but also all of the human connections. Everything that human beings do in the course of their very rich and ornate and personal lives were simultaneously broken down at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The whole fabric of the city was destroyed in a way. In the past, war had always been armies fighting armies. Two sides engaged in a game of chess. The bomb changed that. Having a nuclear weapon was like bringing a hand grenade to a chess match. It doesn't matter whose king is in check when a player can simply blow up the board. Once in mass production, bombs were also relatively inexpensive by military standards, costing about as much as a battleship. The weapon was worth more than the army itself. In theory, a small country with nuclear weapons could beat a large country without them. War would never be the same again. World War II was the last world war as a result of these new weapons. And that was a truly millennial change in human history. Although it would be possible to have world-scale nuclear war, the result would not be victory for any side. The result would be mass destruction throughout the world. It could happen at any time. So what would happen if there was a world-scale nuclear war? It's something many people worry about, with good reason. It's estimated that the explosions and the resulting fires from a nuclear war would cause so much destruction and generate so much soot, smoke, and smog that the sun would essentially be blocked out. Over time, world temperatures would drop people and animals would starve. It would be every bit as destructive as the extinction that destroyed the dinosaurs. 
And yet, in 1945, the United States felt secure in the knowledge that they were the only nation with the power to make that happen. Stalin really did not have a large bomb program during the war, despite all this information coming from espionage, because he didn't trust it. He thought the United States might be trying to trick him with disinformation into wasting a lot of money and resources that he needed desperately to fight the war. Until he got the first word from his observers at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And he suddenly understood that this was not this information. He called in Igor Kuchatov, who was a physicist, and said in so many words, comrade, give me the bomb. 